Hey friends, I've done such a crappy job of keeping up with my schedule of doing a video every week, I decided to throw in another one today. Uh, it's not going to be anything exciting. I'm just going to talk at the camera for a while. Is that okay? Uh, anyway, what it is, is I'm sitting here. It's going to start snowing outside, so I'm waiting for that to happen. We're also expecting a lunar eclipse tonight, so we're hoping to get outside and see that. Uh, keeping in mind that it's minus 20 degrees centigrade here in Minnesota, so we're not going to be comfortable when we're out there looking at the moon. Uh, and while I'm waiting for all that to happen, I'm going to talk about creationists for a little bit. So that's what we're going to do today. Let's laugh at creationists for a little while. Okay, a couple of things have come up recently. First thing I want to mention is that Ken Ham is getting cranky. The Freedom for Religion Foundation wagged its finger at various school districts that were planning to send public school kids on field trips to the ludicrous Ark Park and Creation Museum, which I would consider to be gross miseducation in addition to being a violation of church and state separation. But old Ken, he had an answer. They're just learning about comparative religion. Ken Ham says, If public school classes tour the Ark or museum in an objective fashion to supplement a school's teaching of world religions, literature, interpretation of history, etc., then the field trip with free admission, I don't know what that has to do with it, is an educational experience. See if they look at it objectively. They're being exposed to the reality of world religions. Kind of like how visiting a garbage fire would be a practical lesson in applied chemistry. They're not teaching kids what to think, they're just exposing them to how some people think. Furthermore, he offers an exercise in demarcation, telling us how you'd be able to tell when he has crossed the line. So Ken Ham continues, If students were brought to the Arca Museum and told by their teacher, uh, I would think it would also work if they are told by anyone at the museum, that the religious content should be accepted as truth, then the Establishment Clause of the Constitution, as currently being interpreted by the courts, would be violated. Oh, great. So as long as nobody makes the mistake of telling the students that the peculiar religious beliefs on display are the absolute truth, and that there are dire consequences for not accepting one specific dogma, then they're good. They're teaching about religion, not teaching religion. Except that's exactly what they do. I've been to both of Ken Ham's spectacles, as have many people, and the exclusive religious message of the Ark Park and Museum are really hard to miss. So here's an example. These are photos by Dan Phelps of the actual religious assertions made by Answers in Genesis. So it, sa it says, There is only one door that can save us from eternal judgment. Jesus Christ is that door. He is the only way to be saved from sin. The Bible states that now is the day of salvation. If you have not already done so, Will you turn from your sins and call on the risen Lord to save you? Enter the only door that leads to eternal life today. You know, that doesn't sound like an objective discussion of comparative religion to me. That sounds like somebody threatening you with hellfire if you don't believe as they do. Oh, but there's more. This is a comparative religion class that invokes a Christian prayer. How odd. So this one says, Our storm of judgment is coming, and the Lord has offered mercy and grace through his Son, Jesus Christ. Honor the God of heaven and earth. Follow him and live forever. This is totally inappropriate stuff to teach secular students. It's simply a bad lesson to teach anywhere, period. But I guess some unfortunate people believe it, and they can hear it any old time they want in their local church. But the important point here is that Tam himself demonstrates that his freak shows in Kentucky violate the Establishment Clause of the Constitution by his very own criterion. 
But there's a better reason the school field trip shouldn't be going to Ken Ham's joints. A very practical reason. It's ridiculously expensive. It's almost $50 per person, and there's also a ludicrously expensive parking fee to cover the cost of their gigantic and mostly empty parking lot. And when you get inside, it's mostly an empty box with Christian advocacy posters stuck up on the walls. This picture, by the way, is AIG's own photo of the interior. Attractive, isn't it? It looks like a rustic wooden prison. A big chunk of the of the whole thing looks kind of like this, with just boxes with fake animals in them. And why should you go to this overpriced tourist trap when right there in Cincinnati you have the Museum of Natural History and Science at less than a third the cost with real science exhibits? If you're going to the expense of chartering a bus for a class of students and then driving for hours across the country, make the destination something worthwhile and educational. And it's just up the road. Don't bother with the the Creation Museum or the Ark Encounter. Just go straight here, spend an afternoon in the Museum of Natural History and Science. Now, I don't see how that con artist is going to go out of business anytime soon. Uh, There's lots of rubes out there, lots of people willing to pay to go to his horrible, horrible little exhibit. But the attendance numbers are declining, so there's hope for the future. But I think it's going to be around for a good long time, pulling the same crap on us for years and years to come. After all, there are other creationist organizations that are even more boring than Ken Ham. And they have been lasting for a long time. Uh, The Institute for Creation Research, for instance, was founded in 1970 by Henry Morris. So it's been kicking along for about 50 years now. And they specialize in giving us the most boring, often refuted arguments over and over again. It's really the, the... Creation Museum is interesting to visit just for the collection of tackiness, for the bad arguments on display there, for the amount of money they throw in these various knickknacks and things that they've got on display. Uh, Institute for Creation Research doesn't even have that. They've just got the same old story said over and over again. For example... A recent article in at the ICR says, new shark species is still a shark. Are you shocked? I mean, duh, a shark species is still a shark. It would be news if someone published a paper about a newly discovered shark that wasn't a shark. But let's see what other cliches they can pull out of this one. So here's their article. Although today's oceans are teeming with many unique types of shark, and even more so in the pre-flood world, again, how did they know? Were they there? Anyway, with many unique types of shark, they remain sharks. Yeah, okay, that's just the same thing said over again. Uh, It was stupid the first time, it's stupid the second time. Evolutionist Michael Benton states that sharks of the genus Cladosileke are basal, that is, some of the first sharks to have evolved. Yet these sharks are surprisingly modern looking. Huh, okay, they leave something out of that. Cladosileke has been extinct for 250 million years. Um, and really, the overall appearance of a torpedo shaped chordate predator is going to be superficially similar and vaguely sharky to a general audience. But experts can look at these things and see distinctive features and tell them apart from modern sharks. Why are they glossing over that? Okay, that's a rhetorical question. We know why, because it completely undermines their entire argument. But here's Cladoslaki. Um, yes, to a casual eye, that's simply a shark, like all the other sharks in the, in the sea. Uh, but it's also blunt-toothed and scaleless, 
And I think even if you know nothing at all about sharks, the arrangement of fins and the shape of the tail are distinctive. Pointing to Cladosalaki does not save their argument. It just shows how little they know about sharks. About anything for that matter. And this is the weird gloss I put on it all. Uh, oh, sure, organisms diversify and speciate and change, they say. But then they say that that is not the kind of evolution that evolutionists claim. But it is. It's exactly what biologists say about how evolution works. So the evidence is fitting our expectations perfectly. They resort to inventing bad definitions of evolution and putting them in the mouths of real scientists. Oh, they expect to see fundamentally new creatures arising from sharks, not new varieties of sharks. No, that's not true. We do not expect that. We expect to see sharks arising from sharks. And by gradual and sensible changes over millions of years, transforming into new forms. But all of those new forms are also related to old forms. <sighs> So, so boring, so tedious, you know, kittens coming from puppies, puppies giving birth to kittens. Oh, it's the same old crap over, oh, oh, anyway, yes, boring, boring, boring stuff. I can argue against it in my sleep. I probably should. That's how much time it deserves. Anyway, let's get away from this tired, tedious old stuff that was dead in 1960 when Henry Morris and, and Dwayne Gish and people like that were pushing it to something more important, more significant. There's a big question we're waiting to hear, hear answered, and that is, how big was the boat that didn't exist to rescue biodiversity from a flood that didn't happen? Yeah, I know. You want to know about this. Yeah, we're back to answers in Genesis. If ever you waste your time there, you'll find yourself on a shuttle bus to take you from the immense acreage of the parking lot to the ark itself, and you'll get to listen to a prepackaged spiel from Ken Ham himself, which consists almost entirely of raving about the colossal size of the thing. It's so effusive about this one detail, you would think it was satire. Gosh, where are Really impressed down here, I can tell you. We are supposed to be impressed by the raw size of this big wooden box. First thing you need to know, it's not a boat. It doesn't even try to be a boat. It's a big, boring building, especially if you go around the backside and see there's basically half a boat built onto the side of a mundane, boxy, concrete and steel building. So comparing it to real ships is rather inappropriate. But okay, that's what they're doing. They're saying this is the biggest wooden boat that was ever built. Sure, those other steel-framed boats got larger, but yeah, this was an amazing accomplishment by God, of course. So there it is, 155 meters long. Uh, on their webpage, they also compare it to other things. So they compare it to the space shuttle. Gosh, the big wooden box in Kentucky is longer than three space shuttles. Also, by the way, I've noticed that my arm is four times longer than my phone, but for some reason I can't call out on my elbow. Funny how those inappropriate comparisons don't seem to pan out very far. But, okay, this is a common thing. To compare the size of the object you're praising some otherwise familiar, but in other ways impressive thing. Lots of people do it. I found a couple of really nifty examples. So, for instance, there are people who compare the size of science fictional spaceships to real vessels. Okay, okay, no harm. Kind of entertaining. But most of us realize that saying one version of the Star Trek spaceship is larger than an aircraft carrier doesn't make it as real as an aircraft carrier. Right? Right, I hope. Although I will warn you that if you try to Google spaceship sizes, you will end up in a nerdy wormhole where people are seriously bickering about fractions of a meter in the dimensions of an engine nacelle in an imaginary spaceship. 
Oh, I forgot something. We've got to include Noah's Ark in this comparison. And case closed, when you do the right comparison, it's pathetic in size compared to the 1701D. I bet it's also lacking in phasers and photon torpedoes. But wait, the Ark is supposed to carry animals, so maybe we should make a more appropriate comparison. The Ark was never designed to carry space shuttles, for instance. It was designed to carry animals. So you're probably wondering, how many Godzillas the Ark could hold? The answer is it could hold two of the original 1954 Godzillas, but would be swamped, crushed, and destroyed by a single 2014 Godzilla. I'm going to insist that Answers in Genesis revise their cartoon, and instead of showing how many space shuttles can fit on the Ark, show the number of Godzillas. I'll even grant them the original Godzilla to maximize the number. After all, you should use fictitious animals to illustrate your fictitious boat. That's all I wanted to say. I've got to wrap this up now so I can go out and shovel snow, maybe, if there is much. And if the clouds part for a bit, see the super blood wolf moon. Maybe. Okay, talk to you all later.